Venezuelans are dying in huge amounts. Venezuela was once the richest country in Latin America. It still has the world's biggest oil reserves. But 20 years ago, Venezuelans voted for socialism. They elected Hugo Chavez. Some Americans were excited about that. Model Naomi Campbell visited Chavez, calling him a rebel angel. This is you and uh, Hugo Chavez. <laughs> oh, Michael Moore! Michael Moore! Really? <laughs> he, says, he's, he says, help me write my speech. He is one of the most important forces we've had on this planet. And even today, as Venezuela collapses, many Americans say, don't blame socialism. Actually, blaming socialism for Venezuela's riches to rag story is grossly misleading. Yes, Venezuela is going through an insane political crisis right now, but it's not clear that that crisis has anything to do with their socialist policies. This popular video, The Collapse of Venezuela Explained, never once mentioned socialism. Oil prices plummeted in 2014 and Maduro failed to adjust. Media personalities suggest only conservatives say socialism destroyed Venezuela. If you follow conservative media at all, you may have seen it frequently painted as the inevitable dire consequences of a socialist government. The problem isn't socialism, says John Oliver. It's a story about epic mismanagement. But mismanagement is what happens under socialist governments. It always happens, because no group of central planners is wise enough to manage an entire economy. Even if they have good intentions, the socialists eventually run out of other people's money. The socialist solution then is to print more. That caused massive inflation. If the nation's failed economy is expected to hit 10 million percent inflation this year. When business owners raised prices to keep up with inflation, Government often took away their businesses. This man just had his business taken. Socialists say government can run businesses better than greedy owners who just want profit. And even though that led to tyranny in Venezuela and China and Russia, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Cuba. There are plenty of socialist countries that look nothing like Venezuela. When I talk about democratic socialism, I'm not looking at Venezuela. I'm not looking at Cuba. I'm looking at countries like Denmark and Sweden. Oh yes, those countries do have bigger welfare programs than America does. But they are not socialist. They make a point of saying that. Here's Denmark's prime minister. Uh, Denmark is uh, far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. Not only that, lately they've reduced government control of their economy. They privatized the national phone system and the railroads, and they sold Copenhagen Airport to a private company. It's the same story in Sweden. We did have a period in the 1970s and 1980s when we had something that resembled socialism, a big government that taxed and spent heavily. And that's the period in Swedish history when our economy was going south. So Sweden reduced government's role too. They even instituted school choice. The Scandinavian countries that progressives call socialist successes, not only are they not socialist, they're moving more toward capitalism. The silver lining in Venezuela's collapse is that most Venezuelans who escaped their country's socialism do understand what went wrong. In Florida, reporter Gloria Alvarez asked Venezuelan immigrants. What do you think about socialism? That doesn't work. So no se lo recomendaría a nadie. Well, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Do you think that people, once they get out of Venezuela, do they understand that the problem is socialism? I think that... A great percentage of them do. The problem is a socialist system that they tried to make work, but that has never worked and will never work. It will never work. As Ludwig von Mises wrote, the champions of socialism promised the Garden of Eden, but planned to transform the world into a gigantic post office. Every man a subordinate clerk. I wish progressives understood that. Since they don't, tragedies like Venezuela will happen again and again.
Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is calling for stricter regulation of the web. Facebook wants new regulations. Mark Zuckerberg wrote an op-ed that said, lawmakers often tell me we have too much power over speech and frankly, I agree. We shouldn't make so many important decisions on our own. Wow, it sounds so self-sacrificing. But give me a break. Big companies tend to like regulation because it gives them an advantage over smaller competitors. After all, startups can't afford the squads of lawyers and compliance officers that Facebook employs. In France, they embedded officials inside the company. My position is not that there should be no regulation. Zuckerberg issued his call for regulation after spending hours being grilled by members of Congress. I think the internet is increasingly important. you embrace important. regulation? I, I think the real question as the internet becomes more important in people's lives, is what is the right regulation, not whether there should but, but be or not. But you as a company welcome regulation? I think if it's the right regulation, then yes. Think Zuckerberg's no dope. He sees which way the wind is blowing. So would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. So Facebook will work with politicians to shape regulation. What's sad is that if anyone should fight for permissionless innovation, it should be people like Mark Zuckerberg. It's no accident that the amazing wealth creation that brought us Facebook, Google, Instagram, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, smartphones, computers, all happened in the two big metropolitan areas farthest from Washington, D.C. Microsoft in the early 1990s was the largest company in the world, incredibly successful. And they spent exactly zero dollars on lobbying, on cronyism, on lawyers. They had no presence in Washington, D.C., not a single lawyer. Instead of spending money on lawyers and lobbyists, they spent it on technology. But once politicians noticed their success, they were literally brought in front of Congress. They were yelled at by a Republican, Aaron Hatch from Utah. He said, you guys need to get involved here in Washington, D.C. You need to build a building here. You need to hire lawyers here. In other words, the unspoken text, you need to bribe me. And Microsoft walked out of the meeting and said, you know what? You leave us alone, we will leave you alone. We're, we're busy. We're running the biggest company in the world. There's a lot to do. The Justice Department has charged Microsoft. Six months later, knock on the door at Microsoft. We're from the Justice Department. And we're here to prosecute you because you're offering the American public, you're offering your customers a product for free. This is Internet Explorer at a time when we were buying Netscape and paying money for it, they offered it for free. And that was deemed, you know, bad business practices. A they monopoly. were trying to a monopoly, they were trying to dominate the market. For 10 years, they had to fight that lawsuit. They lost, they got regulated, they got controlled. Guess how much Microsoft spends today in Washington, D.C.? How much? tens of millions of dollars. They have a beautiful building, about equal distance from the White House and from, the, uh, from Congress. They have lawyers, they have lobbyists, they spend a lot of money, and indeed a lot of the other tech companies like Google learned the lesson. The lesson is if you don't want politicians destroying your business, practice self-defense. Go to Washington and give them money, kiss their rings. Making sure to keep politicians at bay. So a lot of the lobbying a lot of the so-called cronyism is self-defense. Yes, and Zuckerberg's acting in self-defense, but it's still ugly. And Silicon Valley's crony capitalism is a threat to future innovation. But in fairness to Zuckerberg, he didn't start it. But let's remember where cronyism comes from. Cronyism occurs when government starts interfering in business. And then business has to defend itself. And as soon as it hires the lawyers and the lobbyists to defend itself, it quickly slips in to now gaining favors from the government who has all this power. If we really want to end cronyism, what we need to do is reduce the power of politicians over our lives, actually separate economics from state. There's an unforgotten phenomenon in any prosperous nation. The medical name we gave this pain is aflu inflammation. Honey, these scientists are saying we shouldn't vaccinate the kids. Oh, Bill Tubb is chugging a jug of cold bovine lactation.
Sean When his eyes didn't realize that Cotton Sides got information And since his life contains no strife, it's aflu inflammation As millions starve across are saved thanks to a new drought-resistant smallpox has taken another Make sure to bundle up out there because it's polio season For the better part of history, diseases are we raging Measles, mumps up on your junk like this ever polio vaccine makes you wonder what I'll pull cause we've got aflu inflammation I'll just put some peppermint oil on it we've got aflu inflammation prioritize profit and the accumulation of money above all else and we seek it at any human and environmental cost oh chip black is cracking the back of 12 life steel Stations. For the perks and glee of living free, he starts to lose appreciation. And if you probe his frontal lobe, yep, aflu inflammation. Everyone's still starving, starving still, starving with a chance of flurries. Still starving here in the country, starving. Wait, what changed? Through the course of human history, each day we face starvation. Rats and pox and chamber pots, streets filled with defecation. Free markets change the norm. Makes you wonder what I'm for. Cause we got aflu inflammation. I really need work. the global economy. We've got aflu inflammation. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Most important meal of the day. So we better eat breakfast. A study from none other than Harvard University states that men who regularly skip breakfast have a 27% higher risk of suffering a heart attack. This disease will lead to heart attacks and strokes. Heart attacks and strokes? Oh no, I skip breakfast. But I'm not worried because now I know there's no proof that skipping breakfast causes heart attacks or any other problem. That Harvard study, the authors actually concluded it remains unknown whether specific eating habits influence heart disease risk. There's no proof that skipping breakfast is harmful in any way. It's been pushed. It doesn't really hold water. Nutritionist Ruth Kava points out that all the claims about breakfast being especially important are just unproven. That strokes and heart attack news persists because people who skip breakfast have more health problems. But that's partly because breakfast skippers are more likely to smoke and eat unhealthy foods. There is just no proof that skipping breakfast itself causes problems. I've skipped breakfast for years. That's fine. Really? Fine. It works for you. You're not fat. We're all different. Yeah, we're all different. We have to do what's comfortable for us. Another myth about breakfast is that skipping it may make you fat. People who skip breakfast were more likely to be the big weight gainers over time. The government claimed that just nine years ago, saying not eating breakfast has been associated with excess body weight. But that's not true either, according to a new analysis. They looked at a number of different studies and they did not find that eating breakfast helped people lose weight. So how did some researchers and our government get it so wrong? Partly because eating habits are hard to study. You can't follow test subjects for years, controlling what they eat. Most studies are based on what people say they ate, and people forget or lie. Also, we may have been suckered by studies funded by cereal makers. Of the 15 studies involving children mentioned by the government, five list funding from General Mills or Kellogg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're the ones that are interested in having their products sold. In fairness, not all cereal companies spin the results. One study funded by Quaker Oats found eating breakfast did not help people lose weight. This study was unfavorable to Quaker Oats, but Quaker Oats said, let's publish it. Good for Quaker Oats. 
But let's not count on companies to tell us the truth about nutrition. Study found people who didn't eat breakfast could lose weight by starting to eat breakfast. <laughs> Kellogg's touted this on their cereal boxes. Don't get your nutrition education from cereal boxes. Are you okay? Yeah. Hi. Right. But what if instead of a cereal box, it's America's first lady on Sesame Street? I am very tired and have no energy. Oh. Uh, I think oh. I know what would help. <sighs> What, Secret Service? Air Force One? No, Grover, a healthy breakfast. Now there is data that shows... Children who do not have decent nutrition during the course of the day have been shown to do better if they get some food into them in the morning. That's where that comes from. It's valid. It's appropriate. Unfortunately, on Sesame Street, Michelle Obama doesn't just say children, she says everyone. <laughs> Grover, breakfast isn't just for first ladies. Everyone should have a healthy breakfast. Oh, not me. And much of the media push nonsense like claims that if you eat the right breakfast, you are going to end up boosting your metabolism, losing the belly fat, restoring gut health. Restoring gut health? There is so much bad information out there. The current consensus is eat breakfast, if you're hungry. Eat breakfast if you're hungry. If not, eat a little later. On January 3rd, 1999, a man named Andrew Goldstein wandered onto this New York City subway platform and shoved a stranger named Kendra Webdale into the path of an oncoming train. With the story making national news, reporters dug into Goldstein's past and found that he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had a history of violent episodes. He had been in and out of psychiatric facilities, but his caretakers repeatedly released him back into the streets against their better judgment because of a shortage of available beds. The murder of Kendra Webdale brought attention to our inability to provide adequate treatment to Americans with severe mental health problems which 20 years later is still ongoing. Prisons and jails are filled with inmates exhibiting symptoms of mental illness and in need of treatment. Many of the homeless people crowding the streets of cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York are mentally ill and in need of care. And violent episodes like the murder of Kendra Webdale have brought renewed calls to bring back one of America's most controversial institutions, the mental hospital and to entrust the state with more authority to force psychiatric care on patients against their will. Some psychiatrists and bioethicists have proposed bring back the psychiatric hospital. You know, in the old days, we had mental institutions, and you could nab somebody like this because, you know, they did. They knew he was, something was off. The parents of mentally ill patients are among the most vocal advocates. They shut down all the hospitals because, oh, we have all these medicines now and everybody can be in recovery. Well, the unfortunate fact is not everybody recovers. So where do they go? What do they do? So is it time to bring back the asylum? And why did it disappear in the first place? My contention is that there is no mental illness and there can be no mental illness. In the mid 20th century, the libertarian psychiatrist Thomas Saws first articulated a theory that would rock the profession and define his career that the whole concept of mental illness was a fraud. Thomas Saz was a psychiatrist who didn't really believe in psychiatry. Having a book by him on your shelf was enough to start an argument. Jacob Sullum interviewed Saz for Reason magazine in 2000 and cites him as a major influence on his own work. He argued what people call mental illness is not a literal uh, disease but a metaphorical disease, what he called problems in living, internal conflicts, conflicts with yourself, conflict with other people. You could ask people to define mental illness, and no one could. One can only give examples of it, like homosexuality, which the American Psychiatric Association voted, that it's no longer a disease, it's only a disease if you don't like it. At the time that Zaz was writing, lots of people were locked up who posed no danger to other people and possibly not even dangerous to themselves in any way. And might be subjected to what today look like horrifying treatments, but at the time were considered to be the height of science. Here the skull is thin enough to transmit light, and it can usually be perforated easily with a sharp instrument without damage to any important structures. But the man who discovered lobotomy and got the Nobel Prize did it on people who didn't want to be lobotomized. 
tens of thousands of Americans were subjected to lobotomy. Did they want to be lobotomized? Lobotomy. If you take a sharp object and stick it up through somebody's eye socket and jiggle it around in their brain, this person who used to be troublesome and disruptive will calm down often. Maybe when you end up with somebody who now is less troublesome to other people, but is impaired for the rest of his life. And you look back and you think, how could that have happened? Like, how did they think that that was a legitimate medical treatment? That was the context. Saz helped to inspire the deinstitutionalization movement that started in the 1950s and hit its stride in the 60s. The time has come for a great national effort. Nearly half of the 530,000 persons in our state mental hospitals are in institutions with over 3,000 patients, getting little or no individual treatment. Many of these institutions have less than half of the professional staff required. 45% of them have been hospitalized for 10 years or more. If we launch a broad new health program now, it will be possible within a decade to reduce the number of patients now under custodial care by up to 50%. Mental hospitals started emptying out and closing down. But critics say deinstitutionalization was a disaster, dumping thousands of mental patients onto the streets with no plan. Even Saz criticized the way deinstitutionalization unfolded. He thought it sort of doubled the injustice that those people were not offered the choice to stay. This is their home, they're being thrown out of now. So he thought that was wrong. The number of psychiatric hospital beds available dropped by 95% between 1955 and 2005, according to the Treatment Advocacy Center. Starting in 1960, as the mental health population in hospitals declined, the number of mentally ill people in jails and prisons shot up. A 2011 Supreme Court case filed against the California Bureau of Prisons revealed that some mentally ill inmates were held in telephone booth-sized solitary cells. Some reformers say it's time to cast aside Thomas Saz and his attack on the mental health establishment. I gotta say, Saz has been totally disproven. It's kind of like believing the church's teachings on an Earth-centric universe. DJ Jaffe first became aware of the enormous problems in America's mental health system after his sister-in-law was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and it proved enormously challenging to get her the treatment she needed. My sister-in-law thought that people across the street were talking about her. The FBI planted a transmitter in her head. There are a section of the mental health industry that believes being psychotic and delusional is a right to be protected rather than an illness to be treated. Being psychotic and delusional is not an exercise of free will, it's the inability to exercise free will. And medications can free people from the bastille of their psychosis and enable them to engage in society. Jaffe says that Saz did offer a valid critique of overreach and overdiagnosis in the mental health industry. There are pieces of these anti-psychiatrists which are true. When you talk about somebody with mild depression, mild ADHD, is it so abnormal as to be classified as a disorder? And we are certainly over-diagnosing and medicalizing that group. People have gotten the sense that he had a good critique at the time, but it's sort of outmoded. It really isn't outmoded. I mean, if anything, the territory claimed by psychiatry is expanding more and more. Look at all the other things that are covered by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the Psychiatric Bible, right? But when it comes to the 4% of the population that the National Institute of Mental Health characterizes as having a serious mental illness, Jaffe says health care professionals need far more power to involuntarily commit patients to dedicated treatment centers. The civil commitment law is not good enough. It basically requires someone to become danger to self or others. We should prevent people from becoming danger to self or others, not require them to become danger to self or others. Jaffe also advocates for a policy called assisted outpatient treatment. 
New York passed Kendra's law in November 1999 after Goldstein's murder of Kendra Webdale. It allows a judge to order outpatient treatment for anyone with a psychiatric diagnosis who's recently been jailed or hospitalized as a result of going untreated and who the court determines will likely deteriorate further without intervention. And I would suggest that it is a libertarian dream. It has lowered rates of homelessness, arrest, incarceration, needless hospitalization in the 70% range for the most seriously mentally ill. And from a libertarian perspective, they maintain more of their freedoms than the alternatives, which are inpatient commitment or incarceration. This idea that we should just abandon the seriously mentally ill who don't recognize their need for treatment serves neither the liberty interest of the individual, the financial interest of society, or the interests of trying to keep the public safe. When you're trying to get help for someone, especially for Misty, who didn't feel like she needed help, it's very, very difficult. Linda Mayo, who lives in Modesto, California, has been advocating for the enactment of Laura's Law in her home county. She's the mother of twin daughters, both with severe mental illnesses, and it's through their experiences that she became an advocate for strengthening the involuntary commitment and compulsory treatment laws. It's not a panacea. It's not going to help everyone. But the people who refuse treatment and consistently refuse treatment and who are in and out of the hospital, in and out of jail, homeless, suicidal, it can help them. Mayo believes that the legal obstacles to involuntary commitment could have cost her daughter her life. One day five years ago, Misty, who was 38 and has schizoaffective disorder, vanished. Mayo discovered that after collecting her $200 paycheck, she had boarded a bus to Los Angeles. I was frantic. She was in a big city that she was unfamiliar with and we had no family or friends there. Very little money, I thought $200, that's gonna go fast. She had already been sleeping in the parks here before she left and roaming the streets. So I thought in LA, it scared me more. Another week and a half went by. Finally, the phone rang. It was LAPD. She was in a neighborhood and sitting on a cliff and the neighbors were concerned about her. In Mayo's view, Misty posed a threat not only to herself, but to others as well. Mayo later found out that during the time she was missing, Misty had been arrested in a shopping mall. I can't tell you what was going through her head, but she was trying to take a baby out of a baby carriage. And the mother said no, and Misty didn't heed that. So she was arrested. For years, Misty had been refusing therapy and medication. After her arrest, the state had legal grounds for forcing her to comply with treatment. Linda believes this saved Misty's life. I was very happy that she was being allowed to be in the hospital for a longer period of time that would require some stabilization. Laura's law, in her view, creates a legal path to giving seriously mentally ill patients like Misty the help they need before they pose a danger to themselves or others. This is one step saying, okay, we want to catch you in a court order before it's a crime, before it's a hospitalization, before it's homelessness. But some mental health advocates say that Laura's law and similar bills violate the rights of even seriously mentally ill patients. There's a big perception in my community that once they get their claws on you, just like law enforcement, they're not letting you go if they can help it. Richard Krzyzanowski, who himself has suffered from severe depression, is a patient's rights advocate who has worked for LA County representing mentally ill individuals committed against their will. Some of the most disempowering and dangerous words anyone can say is we're doing this for your own good. Uh, you know, we're here to help you. But if I'm not asking for help... When you see somebody walking down the street screaming, I am the Messiah. It's not because they think they're the Messiah. They know they're the Messiah. They are unaware that they are ill and we should be delivering treatment to them. But Krzyzanowski says that mental health professionals and reformers often abuse the concept of too sick to know you're sick to violate the rights of the mentally ill. It's a way of saying, I don't have to listen to you, or more to the point, 
you're now voiceless. The whole involuntary treatment is a hard balance. No one wants involuntary. All the advocates that I've talked to, th this is the last thing that we want. But there are cases that require it. And Krzyzanowski says that even though the state institutions are gone, to this day, many psychiatric patients are locked in facilities for weeks or even months at a time under court orders giving legal power over financial and health care decisions to a third party under an arrangement called conservatorship. The most difficult calls we would get, especially during anybody's holiday season, would be people who are on conservatorship, were locked away somewhere, they were able to get a phone call and you just felt like you were talking to one person alone like they'd been locked away in a dungeon and hadn't seen the light for like months. Another problem with the idea of bringing back state mental hospitals is that in the current system, Commitment often exacerbates symptoms. A study published in the medical journal Psychiatric Services found that alarmingly high numbers of patients admitted to one state-run mental health system witnessed traumatic events, were secluded or restrained, and even suffered physical assault. We can change the whole historic dynamic of the use of coercion in people with, with serious mental illnesses. Psychiatrist Scott Zeller is the founder of the Alameda Model, a movement dedicated to reforming how mental health institutions operate. It focuses on getting psychiatric patients out of hospital emergency rooms as quickly as possible and into dedicated mental facilities that respect their right to personal space and freedom, even if they've been involuntarily committed. Typically, if you're in a psychiatric emergency, you're very paranoid or you're very frightened or you're very despondent or you're very anxious. And imagine going into the general ER with those kind of symptoms and basically being put into a small space and said, you're going to have to stay here and you can't move. And then people tend to get worse in ERs. The Providence Medical Center in San Pedro, California, which uses Zeller's approach, is a standalone building just down the road from a hospital. Unlike in hospitals, which are often lacking in on-call psychiatrists, staff are able to medicate and stabilize patients around the clock, sometimes through the use of telepsychiatry if a doctor isn't on site, with the goal of discharging them for outpatient treatment within the first 24 hours of admission. People can move about. Nobody's telling them, get back in that corner. What we find is the vast majority of the time, these folks are going to get better within 10, 15, 20 hours tops. And the idea that we were holding them for three days to send them to a hospital makes so little sense when you're thinking we could have had them home the same day. The average psychiatric emergency patient in a general medical ER, it may be 25 to 50 percent of them will end up being physically restrained, leather restraints around wrists, ankles. In an empath unit, we're talking about far less than one percent. People respond very well to a supportive, interactive, nurturing environment, not so much to a coercive, cold environment. Go figure. Is social deviation within the province of medicine. Zeller says there's one lesson from Zaz that family members of the seriously mentally ill should internalize. There's no level of coercion that can force some patients to conform with societal norms. As long as they don't pose a danger to themselves or others, in some cases, the best path forward is acceptance. If somebody says, I want to live on a tent downtown, pretty much you have to let them. It's really, really difficult to determine when you should believe that they no longer have the right to decide for themselves. I think that we should be overly safe on the side of protecting individual rights. I can't have pictures up in my house of when they were babies and junior high and high school and college. It's the shine, the light in their eyes that I miss. That sense of joy and fun and happiness is out of the eyes and uh, that makes me really sad. Looking for a job as a makeup artist, teaching ballroom dancing or blow drying hair? In some parts of the country, you'll need government certification before anyone can pay you for these services or face jail time. Occupational licensing laws, which apply to one in three U.S. jobs, restrict consumer choice by protecting businesses from competition. 
They also impose substantial costs on job seekers. Arizona has one of the nation's most heavily regulated labor markets, but now the state's businessman turned governor, Doug Ducey, who's the former CEO of Cold Stone Creamery, has made occupational licensing reform a priority. What I wanted Arizona to be is the best place in the country to live, work, and do business. And part of that is beginning a business as well as scaling a business. And that was our focus on improving that, that structure of, of government and really stopping the, the bullies that were part of the boards and commissions. Since occupational licensing laws are particular to each state, if you're a certified hair dryer, say in Virginia, that doesn't mean you can move to Arizona and just start working. First, you have to complete a thousand hours of training before you can obtain a state cosmetology license. Governor Ducey is backing a new law that would change that. Just because somebody packs up that moving van in Chicago, Illinois, they don't lose their skills on the way to the state of Arizona. So why should somebody have to suffer a burden of thousands of dollars or weeks or months of recertification in a skill that they already have? We had a tough time figuring out how many regulations there are in the state of Arizona. With a Cracker Jack staff, it took us probably 18 months to figure out there were 11,000 regulations in the state. In 2017, Ducey issued an executive order requiring that state licensing boards review and provide justification for rules the governor's office deemed excessive. The next day, he signed the Right to Earn a Living Act, which restricted state boards from issuing any new occupational licensing rules that couldn't be justified on health and safety grounds. I think it's important that we remember who the voters are and who the citizens are, and we're here to serve them. Too many of these boards and commissions exist to stop competition, to stifle and protect the status quo, and we're changing that in Arizona. My issue is that uh, we don't really know what the standards are in these other states. And so why should we dumb down our standards uh, just to deregulate, basically? I mean, I see this as sort of deregulation for the sake of deregulation. Representative Pamela Powers Hanley of Tucson is opposed to the legislation. What I see here is, you know, over and over and over again, you know, throwing out uh, licenses and certifications. And uh, there was other bills that were proposed in the House this year that would go even farther than this as far as deregulating, deregulating occupations. And I think at some point it gets a little risky for the populace. How so? I mean, because if you have if you're successful in another state doing this, I mean, it's not like those skills don't stop well, when you come into the state. Well, yes, but with this, we're only asking for one year of experience. I mean, what, what's the definition of successful? And then also, how are we checking up on these people? What about this idea of public safety? Because I do think there's a fear that you're actually going to attract people from states that have lower standards than Arizona. Public health and public safety is always going to be a priority for this administration. We're going to work with the individuals that are coming and with the licensing boards in which they came from to make sure that we're making good decisions. But I'm confident with the legislation we have, with the guardrails uh, and details that it involves, that we'll be bringing qualified people here. And then ultimately, uh, it will be the opportunities that will determine their success. Arizona's overregulated labor market drew public attention in 2017 when it came out that a student barber named Juan Carlos Montes de Oca was being investigated by the State Cosmetology Board for giving haircuts to homeless vets without a license. The bullies at the State Cosmetology Board sought to stop him and stall his career because he hadn't yet kissed their ring. We thought he was just doing a good act for people that were in need. And this was a young person just in the uh, formative years of, of their, their career. We thought that was the wrong thing to do. And we were very pleasantly surprised by the response that we received from the electorate saying, yes, we don't need this overreach. We don't need this overregulation. The new bill recognizing out-of-state certification recently passed the House and is currently under consideration in the state Senate. We still have to prove it in the marketplace. We still need to get it through both houses of the, of the legislature. Ducey credits his deregulatory agenda for Arizona's booming economy. We're the fourth fastest growing state in the nation. Maricopa County, where we are here in Greater Phoenix, is the number one fastest growing county in America two years running. We're uh, a state that has 70% of the adults here were born somewhere other than the state of Arizona. 
I don't think that there's a better leading indicator in this country than that people pack up a U-Haul truck and say, that's where I want to move to. In the game of states, people vote with their feet, and Arizona's winning. People are going to have to start paying their fair share in taxes. Their fair share? Are you paying your fair share? What would that be? Do you have a specific on the tax rate? You know, you look at our tax rates back in the 60s. On 60 Minutes, the darling of the progressive movement didn't appear to have a specific rate in mind. But then she said... Uh, sometimes you see tax rates as high as 60 or 70 percent. Suddenly, that became the progressive plan. I can support uh, folks at the top paying their fair share. 70 percent, 80 percent. We've had it as high as 90 percent. 90 percent was the top tax rate when I was a kid. And now Democrats say if we just raise taxes on the wealthy, government will have plenty of money to pay for all their wonderful programs. But it's a myth. What progressives don't say is that no one actually paid anywhere close to those rates. No one? No one. Economic historian Phil Magnus says it's not surprising that progressives don't know that 90% tax rates didn't bring in lots of money. Uh, you know, who has the time and the interest to sit around and dig through that line by line? You. Me, I'm apparently the guy. He's researched old tax codes for over a decade. You must be a really boring guy. I, I can be. <laughs> During World War II, America's 90% tax bracket didn't bring in that much more money because rich people found loopholes. And then, because the high rates discouraged work, President Kennedy backed a bill that lowered the top rate to 70%. The billions of dollars this bill will place in the hands of the consumer and our businessmen will have both immediate and permanent benefits to our economy. But it turned out that the 70% rate wasn't very real either. No one paid 70%, let alone right. 90%. What did they pay? A millionaire on average would pay 41%. Because when taxes are high, rich people find loopholes. Uh, there's all these deductions and exemptions and carve-outs that are intentionally baked into the tax code. Newspapers ran ads, crews for free, $2,499 value. And basically take a vacation around the Caribbean uh, but while you're on board the ship, you attend, say, an investing seminar or a real estate seminar, and then right off the trip. The whole trip. The whole trip. Deductions became so complex that rich people, instead of inventing, say, a precursor to the iPhone, hired accountants to study the tax code. Who can afford the best accountants? It's always the wealthy. Today, the top tax rate is 37 percent. The top rate started dropping again after Ronald Reagan said 70 percent was outrageous. Our tax system could only be described as un-American. And the Democrats actually agree with them. Reagan goes to the table and says, let's make a deal. We can cut the rates down to something uh, closer in approximation to what we have today. And in exchange, we'll consolidate the tax code. Vacation deductions and other exemptions were killed, leading to a slightly simpler tax code. And surprise, the lower rates brought in just as much money. Turns out that tax revenue as a percentage of the economy stays about the same no matter what the top tax rate is. When rates are high, rich people sometimes work less. It's just economics. People don't work to pay taxes. Economist Art Laffer told President Reagan, rich people will evade high taxes. They'll change where they earn their income. They'll change how they earn their income. They'll change how much they earn. When they receive the income, they'll change all of those things to minimize taxes. They will leave the United States. And this not yet president pointed out that if taxes go up, rich people may move away. You haven't left. I haven't left yet. Are you going to leave? Big story if I leave, I guess. If I leave New York, that's a big story. Look, the rich people are going to leave and other people are gonna leave. You're gonna end up with lots of people that don't produce and then that's the spiral, that's the end. And that's what's happened in, there's some European examples, so France, attempted a massive tax on its wealthiest earners. And what they found is the business people 
left in a mass exodus from the, uh, the country. But progressives are selective when they look at history. Under Republican, pres uh, Republican administration, Dwight Eisenhower, we had 90% marginal tax rate. The government will collect more and do good things. Well, well, that's the claim, but you're asking for an economic disaster. So I ask the question, do we leave it in the private sector where the market decides, or do we subject it to corrupt politicians? I say, let the market decide. Of course, when the market decides, some people get really rich. And then progressives say, The rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. But that's not true. The poor don't get poor. That's another economic myth. We'll cover that in an upcoming video.